I had a family at the uh, church I served um, who uh, the mom, whenever her daughter would ask a question, would say, let's ask Pastor Shelby. And so there would be some Sundays when she would come with like a notepad full of questions that they had saved up through the week to ask Pastor Shelby. So I got a lot of experience answering questions, not to mention I have my own children who ask me plenty of questions too. Um, I really appreciated that Blake brought up questions because it is amazing that Jesus answers the disciples' question, but in true Jesus fashion, the answer is not something that they necessarily wanted to hear. Oftentimes, the questions we ask, we have a certain idea of what we expect as a response. And it can be challenging when we hear an answer that we don't agree with, or we aren't ready to hear, or an answer that we don't like. But Jesus is there to hear our questions, and sometimes to answer them. Let us hear the word of God as it comes to us, the gospel according to Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their leaders, as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord, and may God, who is rich in mercy, grant us insight into this gospel. And with that insight, faith and courage for the living of our days. Amen. Jesus and his disciples are still on their journey to Jerusalem. Jesus has told his disciples several times what this means. And in the verses immediately preceding this passage, Jesus explains exactly what is going to happen to him when he gets there. He will be condemned to death, handed over, mocked, spit upon, flogged, and killed. Yes, he will rise again, but it will not be pretty. And yet the disciples still do not understand. They come to Jesus and say, Teacher, we want you to do what." Ever we ask of you. I think Blake used the word audacity. Whatever we ask of you? Really? Come on, James and John, they might as well be pestering Jesus about whether they can watch just one more show or whether they'll be able to have dessert tonight. It really 
heightens the request of James and John that Jesus has just told them this. It shows them the contrast, shows us the contrast between what they understand and what Jesus is telling them. Jesus tells them he is going to die and they can only talk about glory and how important they want to be. They still think that Jesus is headed for glory and triumph, and they want positions of the greatest prominence at his right hand and his left. Biblical scholar William Placker says that they have not understood the egalitarian nature of this new community or the suffering that awaits Jesus on this journey. So Jesus challenges them on both accounts. Are they ready to suffer what he will suffer? He uses the images of being baptized and drinking the cup. And in the Greek, baptism can also mean flooded with calamities. The image that that word paints is not unlike drowning. And the cup, as Jesus explains to them, is the cup of his blood. These images are both symbols of our sacraments and symbols of threats, which would have been appropriate and profound for the church at Mark's time, where joining the Christian community or participating in worship did risk torture or death. It's easy for us to read this text and wonder what on earth is going on in the minds of James and John. How, after all this time with Jesus, they can still imagine that they are capable of doing what Jesus does. Their reaction to his statement is based on their understanding of glory, not God's. God's glory requires a complete readjustment of values that none of the disciples wanted to do just yet. Preaching professor Caroline Lewis suggests that maybe these disciples are like us, living in a world that has changed beyond our own recognition, a world that has been broken open, but hoping that it actually hasn't changed that much. I think James and John and the other disciples couldn't possibly realize what they would face until they saw Jesus on the cross. How could they know what glory looked like until that very moment? At this point, to them, glory still looks like a fancy chair next to the person sitting on the throne, so naturally that is what they ask for. But Jesus turns their idea of glory upside down. Perhaps we are more like James and John than we care to admit. We fall back on what we know, on what's comfortable, on how the world has always worked. For James and John, that meant glory as hierarchy and power as prestige, and in our 21st century world, it looks about the same. And now we are able to see how much suffering can be caused by exercising power rather than acting in service. We might feel as though we are living in a time when everything is being turned upside down. And we can no longer think of suffering as something that happens at a distance, far away from us. Suffering is a communal act. We hear it from our friends. We see it on the news. We even carry the suffering of the world around with us in our pockets every day. For those of us with eyes to see and ears to hear, we know that the suffering of one is intimately connected to the suffering of us all. I would be remiss if I did not lift up that there are some issues with the language of suffering, with the ways that it has been taught in some places that suffering is somehow necessary 
for redemption or good things to happen. In Mark, Jesus' redemption is not confined only to the scene of his crucifixion. In fact, the liberation of Jesus comes as much from his life as it does from his death. Oftentimes, the emphasis on suffering has had damaging effects in some cultures as suffering for a reason has become the rhetoric of the powerful, the ones who tend to suffer very little. One commentator suggested that a better translation of this final verse of this passage might be, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for the freedom of many. And in fact, the common English Bible translation says that whoever wants to be first among you must will be the slave of all, for the human one didn't come to be served, but rather to serve and to give his life to liberate many people. Theologian James Cone said that to be slave of all is to recognize that the struggle for liberation is for all. This recognition does not make one submissive to unjust powers, but humble before Jesus Christ, whom we acknowledge as Lord of all. Humility is the opposite of glory, which the disciples don't seem to yet understand. They equate the kingdom of God with the only kind of kingdom they have seen in their lifetime, one of power and glory for some at the expense of life and flourishing for others. Like James and John, Jesus calls us to a life of service with a posture of humility, but we don't always like that. What leadership and greatness look like must be on all of our minds right now. We can see that the leadership of Jesus is just so opposite from what the world tells us leadership should look like. The disciples say they are ready to take on what Jesus will take on, but their readiness to endure these things is based on their own understanding of glory. God's glory entails a complete readjustment of our values. When our world is spinning out of control and life as we know it seems to be slipping away, we grasp at what we knew to be true before things started to turn upside down. This passage calls us to rethink our worldview, and that is not easy. We went through a collective reframing in 2020, facing down a pandemic that left no life untouched. And there are all sorts of seasons where we must rethink, reassess, and respond differently than we would have before. Maybe it's the newborn stage or sending your kids off to college. Maybe it was recovering from an operation or an endless season of chronic pain. Maybe grief or loss or worrying about someone you love as they go through something terrible has upended the way you see the world. We face down strange, surreal, and impossible moments that cause us to reframe the way we see the world all the time. Like the disciples, we hold tight to the idea that the future is within our own control. Jesus reminds us that this is not the case. We don't know what cups we will drink from, we don't know what baptisms we will face, but we can be certain that we will not face them alone. The one who came to give his life for us is the one who loves us 
to the very end. Thanks be to God. Amen.